FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. Hey, if you've been around, if you've been watching, you know that stock markets are hitting record highs. How can this be when the real economy really is not hitting record highs? Well, employment is good, but there's a lot of storm clouds on the horizon. What's your opinion of the economy? Is it treating you right? Are you getting what you need out of it? Well, please email us kl at kerrylutz.com with your views and your opinions, and we will share them on air with everybody, all of you who are listening. So one person who definitely has an opinion about it is Peter Hanks. Peter, you are an analyst at Delhi FX. We're thrilled to have you on here. So uh, you've, been, you've been a student of the financial markets, according to what I've read here, since your teens. And when you look back on all these years of watching the markets, what have you learned from all this? Well, I've learned a lot, uh, quite simply, but there's a lot of conflicting themes that are always really uh, vying for control of the market's direction. So most recently, as we now know, we're at all-time highs for the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, and we still have these worrisome backdrops of trade wars, uh, monetary policy, slowing manufacturing, not only in the United States, but also in other areas of the world. So really what I have learned in my time studying the market is just to pick up on what investors are concerned about most with at any given time. Mm -hmm. And what is the best source for figuring out that what, what the current fixation of of investors out there is. And then I guess we got to be more specific because there are investors and you know, there are people like retirees, then there are younger people, then there's institutional investors. The institutions move the markets though, right? That's correct. The institutions are definitely the uh, big players. And I mean, it takes millions of retail traders to really carry the same weight that some of these institutions do. So from our perspective as retail investors, um, people looking to manage their 401ks or day trade or something like that, um, it really depends on what asset class you're trading. And depending on what asset class you're trading, that will dictate where you get your news. So I'm a little bit biased, but for foreign exchange news, daily FX is a great place. Um, But if you're looking to trade stocks or options, maybe it's really important to find a source that aligns with your strategy. So whether that be the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg or some major uh, news publication, it's very, very important that you keep on top of what uh, is really exposed in your portfolio. So if you're heavy into a specific sector, you're going to want to continually keep tabs on that sector and all these macro themes like uh, slowing global growth or trade wars, as I've mentioned, they can have large impacts on these specific sectors more so than on uh, a very related sector. And uh, one thing though, and investors kind of wind up in this, you wind up in an echo chamber where you're using the news that you're receiving to validate what you believe now, ignoring the news that doesn't agree with your investment thesis. That's a real danger, isn't it? That's absolutely correct. And uh, that is a real danger to some degree. I think if you're trading your account daily and you're looking for, um, if you have a thesis, let's say, and you're looking for some information to back that up, um, it's, it can be tricky to just skim over everything until you find something that says, hey, your original thesis might be the correct one. Um, but I do think if there is someone else out there, particularly a, a major network or an analyst that you find particularly in tune with the markets, if they're saying something similar, then there might be some credence to um, your investment plan, your strategy. So it is important to uh, keep, a tie, keep a tab on that. So let's bring that to the current time here. You know, the uh, all we've heard about is how awful this uh, recovery has been, this 11-year recovery. It can't go on. You know, it reminds me of that old uh, saying that stocks uh, climb on a wall of worry. 
And we certainly have had uh, a great wall of worry, uh, maybe, maybe as high as uh, Trump's wall on the border of worry. And yet the market, <laughs> the market has just kept on going up and up. Granted, our last high, I believe, before this one was January of 2018. But that's not unusual because you have periods of consolidation. The question is, how much longer, Peter, can this go? What do you think? What does the uh, what do the so called experts, maybe at the Wall Street Journal, at Barron's, at the at numerous other publications, what do they think? So that definitely is the the big big question that everyone's trying to answer. And one of the sayings that I've seen floating around is that bull markets don't die of old age, but they do get a little brittle. And I really buy into that. Um, we have gone on eleven years as you said, and there's still signs that we can continue. Um, this past earnings season was, I would argue, on the positive side, although many analysts forecasted some doom and gloom. But the real question, I guess getting back to your question, uh, how much longer do we have and what are the experts saying? It's really difficult to say, well, in six months, you know, time's up. Um, with things like this that pan out over so many years and so many quarters, the writing can be on the wall for a number of quarters ahead of time. And we're seeing that now with, or potentially seeing that now with some of these yield curve inversions. That's been a, an indicator of recession for a long time, but something um, analysts look to. And we're also seeing slowing global growth around the world. So with those signals, just because they materialized doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, well, we have this bearish signal, this bearish moment, um, now recession is here. Um, but at some point, all those signals do almost threaten to become self-fulfilling prophecy. So when you get people from Barron's or the Wall Street Journal or Daily Effects coming in and saying, well, look at all these um, worrisome signs, maybe we should start to roll back our exposure. Um, our portfolio should shift maybe to more cash because cash is king and much safer than being long tech stocks or long equities or something like that. Um, with all those investors, especially institutional players, if they start to roll back their exposure, that's effectively taking cash out of the market and undercutting these stock gains and things like that. So it can begin to accelerate those bearish signs. Now, if you're looking for a specific time frame, um, going back to the yield curve inversion, that's been a pretty perfect predict predictor, a pretty accurate predictor um, of a recession over the next year once the initial inversion occurs. So going off of that, we still have around six to eight months um, before investors might really start to show concern of that signal. But that's something we'll have to keep tabs on. And really, everything can change in the matter of days with these trade talks and uh, monetary policy from the Fed. So speaking of the trade talks, uh, they've been a constant fixture for more than a year now. And yet... Uh, Nobody really knows what's going on. Uh, what we do know is uh, China needs food. They're having a swine flu epidemic uh, that has killed off um, maybe as much as 50% of their herd and the herd in Southeast Asia and in Asia. And now it's spreading to other countries really bad. Uh, the, uh, they're switching to chicken. Uh, the only place they can get this stuff is basically from the U.S. And... So maybe they're going to become a little more willing to deal in the coming weeks and months ahead. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Silver One Resources is an exploration and development company backed by strategic investors Eric Sprott and SSR Mining. The company is focused on its Candelaria Mine Project in Nevada, where there is already a historic resource estimated at 127 million ounces of silver. The Candelaria Mine historically was the highest grade silver producer in Nevada, generating over 68 million ounces of silver at an amazing average production rate of over 1,250 grams per ton. The project has tremendous expansion potential as past drilling has outlined deeper, high-grade silver targets for future drill programs. Silver One is highly leveraged to the price of silver and is cashed up and poised to increase shareholder value. Silver One trades in New York under the ticker SLVRF and in Toronto under the ticker SVE. To learn more, go to silverone.com. That's silverone.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Yeah, that definitely has been a major story and it's kind of difficult for society to just completely shift its taste overnight like that so i mean if someone cut off our supply of hamburgers or i'm in chicago so if they cut off our 
five hot dogs, um, <laughs> you know, something overnight, very hard to just say, well, I guess I like chicken now. I don't want a hot dog anymore. Um, so to get a, a buy-in from the Chinese people, the Chinese public into shifting their taste is going to be really difficult. And that could be to your point, um, a huge reason as to why China could come back to the table and maybe feel some pressure uh, to negotiate because a lot of people have said that or a lot of analysts share the belief that China has a much longer time horizon than the United States does because when our presidents change, um, our policy toward any given nation can shift with that president. So pretty much overnight, we could have a drastic shift in policy. So the belief has been that China is willing to kind of uh, just play the long game and outlast us. But if it comes down to the Chinese public not getting what they want on their plates uh, at every meal, then that could be a major factor. And the threat now is that they're going to look elsewhere, whether it be to Brazil or Argentina. Still, I am hesitant to suggest that those com- or those countries are or would be able to really offer the supply that the United States has the potential to offer. Uh, I totally agree with you there when it comes to soybeans, which is the primary feedstock of hogs. Uh, the U.S. is the largest producer, barring none. There are other countries, obviously South America. I think Russia produces some. But in the amount that they need here, uh, really the U.S. is the uh, only game in town. Well, all of that stuff will go on. Which, are you surprised that, that the uh, trade talks and the ups and downs with China have had seemingly as little effect long-term on the stock market as they have? Uh, that's difficult to say. I, I wouldn't say that they've had a uh, little effect. It's, it's just hard to see that effect and really identify it. Um, so if we're a lot of the times headlines will come out any given day because of progress or lack of progress in trade talks, and you'll see the Dow down maybe a hundred points or something like that. Um, I like to think that over time, if that, if that macro concern of that headwind were never there, we wouldn't have those same down days where it's just chipping away at the Dow Jones a little bit. Um, it might be a much stronger, much healthier market. But as time goes on and these tariffs continue to remain in place, it is uh, a lingering concern, especially now ahead of the holiday season. If those are on some retail goods and the average U.S. consumer goes out to the market or out to Amazon to buy some toys for Christmas and they're 15 percent higher than they were in the past, that could really cut down on consumer spending. And that's um, really the backbone of the U.S. economy is that consumer appetite. Mm-hmm. Well, the consumer's been strong so far, but you know the thing that's overhanging all of this is uh, escalating debt. And at some point, that debt is going to have to be dealt with. Are they going v- to wait for, for uh, the crisis to occur, or, or are they, uh, they going to be proactive about it? Well, I hope they would be proactive. Um, I do agree that debt is spiraling, and um, it's, it's, we're going to have to deal with it someday. Right now, it doesn't really seem like anybody wants to take up that issue, that, that torch of cutting back on spending. And I think that could really come back to bite us. And unfortunately, we might have to wait until a crisis does develop, um, because that would maybe spur some urgency, some, some uh, cooperation across the aisle. But as it stands now, it, I'd argue, looking pretty bleak for the near term. Yeah. Yes, uh, that it is. And uh, at some point, you know, I guess that's just the way democracy works. But I don't see the Chinese trying to head off their debt crisis either. And arguably their debt crisis is, uh, is potentially dwarfs the rest of the world. They've printed so much money, made put so much credit out there, and they could be hit worse than any other country in the world because they've got uh, trillions and trillions of bad credit on the books and many of much of their bank loans have been made to undeserving uh undeserving unworthy borrowers that are state uh, enterprises that they have no choice but to lend to we know that eventually uh, the debt will uh, exact a toll yeah uh it is difficult to get a gauge on as well because some of their figures are a little bit what's the word massaged perhaps yeah. um oh, yeah. so the u.s the u.s has you know we have x amount of debt and the, the world widely believes that 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 figure that dollar amount is on the money um the mm-hmm. same cannot be said for china so there's a little bit of uncertainty there and 
really if that uh, right now it might be helping them mm-hmm. because people and the rest of the world might not know just how bad it is, uh, how bad their situation is, how much debt they have. But once it gets to the point where even their ability to obscure the facts a little bit or um, present them in a way that they can see not as bad as it really is. Once they're unable to do that and just the, the debt payment and default begins to happen, if it does happen, I'm not saying it's a certainty by any means, but once that starts to materialize, I think that's when the wheels will really come off the bus very, very quickly. And if they are such a major global player now, um, that could have ramifications for you know the United States and the rest of Asia and as well as uh, other developed economies in Europe. So it's, uh, it's a dangerous position to be in. and We'll have to see how it unfolds. Yeah, and unfold it will for sure. So looking out ahead, you think there's more record territory for the indices ahead? I do, actually. I think it's very hard to argue against all-time highs. Um, Over the longer term, I'm a little bit more bearish. I do see a ton of concerns out there. I mean, even ones that the stock market or that investors might not be looking to today, like the um, government debt, things like that. I don't think that'll have any impact over the next year or two, but over the longer term, that's a concern that we'll have to reconcile. Um, Nearer term, trade war is still a concern. Um, Uh The efficacy of monetary policy and lower rates, is the Fed going to continue to cut rates and stimulate the economy? Are they going to do quantitative easing, which they've said, uh, they've been so-so on, but they've said is a potential possibility. they seem to be doing it All now. Those, They're buying sixty yeah. billion a month of, uh, I guess, of mortgage-backed securities. So you got to keep the uh, the housing the housing uh, market afloat, right? It is a little odd that um, at the, the Fed meeting they'll come out and say, "Well, we're not looking to do quantitative easing um, anytime soon," and then they're expanding their balance sheet quite aggressively over the last month. So it's it's kind of been dubbed "quote unquote" not QE by some of the investment community, the financial news media. Um, because the Fed has been hesitant to call it that. But I would venture to say that it is very much getting into that territory. Um, So with that major tailwind and the willingness of the Fed to explore that policy, that's one of the main drivers, I think, behind these new highs that we're seeing on the market. And until that changes or until they roll that back, um, I think we could could continue to press higher. So uh, I do see new highs on the horizon. All right. Well, I'm in complete agreement with you. Uh, I think we got to leave it at that. Just tell us, uh, Peter, what is the best website to find you at? How do we connect with you on the web? So the best website to find me at is dailyfx.com. Uh, just daily and then the letters FX. You can also follow me on Twitter at Peter Hank FX. Uh, I look at a, a laundry list of stocks from a macro view. So taking into account all these major issues, trade wars, monetary policy, and looking down to the single stock level, but also the broader market. All right. Hey, and make sure out there you send us an email. Send us emails with what you think. We'd love to hear from you. The email address, as you're probably well aware, is kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feed at Carrie Lutz. Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. And visit our site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for your free newsletter. Peter, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Carrie. I really appreciate the opportunity. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.